Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be here. It was a long flight to get here, but always once I'm here, I enjoy it very much. Um, a lot of overlap with the previous speakers this morning. When I got the invitation, I was asked to talk specifically about problem solving and my experiences with problem solving. So I'm, I'm happy to share that. There will be some overlap with the previous speakers, which uh, means we're all drinking from the same Kool-Aid or stealing from the same uh, footnotes, apparently. Um, so the next button, where do I push this? There we go. So a little about my background, just briefly, four types of problems and why I think it's important to break it up into at least four approaches. Again, your mileage, your, your, your situation may vary, and you'll have to think about that for your situation. But uh, I do believe one size does not fit all, and you have to figure this out for your organization and situation. Uh, my background is a little strange and unique. I, I was very lucky. I actually worked for Toyota Motor Corporation in Japan uh, a long time ago. I'm actually um, I'm 51. But 30 years ago, 21, I graduated from a, a college, and I got to study on a graduate study scholarship program in Japan for 18 months after that. And then just accidentally, I was recruited to uh, start working for Toyota at a very, very young age, 22. And not only was that a, just in itself a great experience, of all places, I got assigned to Kamigo Engine Plant, which uh, was, was founded by Taichi Ono, who'd, who had retired you know, quite a, several years before I, I got there. But he was still a legendar legendary man, lots of influence, and many of his key disciples were still um, active there. So my, my background is engine, engines, transmissions, chassis, that, that kind of stuff. That's always what uh, I did in Toyota. But I, I left them, came back to the United States, became a director of improvement. Like many of you, had to learn to facilitate improvement in a company that was you know, traditional and resistant and not wanting to move forward sometimes. And then about 13 years ago, I started my own company, uh, Art of Lean. And some of you may know, again, the, the three books that Dave mentioned. Uh, I do some speaking activities like this. But I, I really enjoy the most uh, getting out to see clients and work with them, frankly, on just this topic of problem solving. Because as simple as it sounds, most, most organizations are stuck. We, we can put together fancy presentations on it, create PowerPoint slides, and talk about our programs. But when I actually go, anywhere in the world to any organization, including Toyota, there, there's quite a tremendous amount of difficulty around actually doing this topic well, okay? And case by case, company by company, it, it, really, does, it really does vary. Uh, but one of the things I primarily see, and this is not just my opinion, John Shook and I got together and kind of reflected and thought about what we could do to help, help companies get off to an easier footing. If you're advanced in your lean journey, maybe this is already obvious to you. But companies that start in lean often struggle on this topic of problem solving and, and people development. And one of the problems, frankly, is they read my book, A3 Thinking, or they read John's book, Managing to Learn, and they find the template in that book and say, aha, this is it. If we just take this one template and use it, it must work, because Art said so or John said so, and they, they worked for Toyota a long time ago, so they must be smart. Well, I got bad news for you. Um, Template's not going to solve your problem. One size does not fit all, and there are many shades of gray. Again, I, I've never seen, we may have a template in Toyota, a standard way of thinking, but by the time it's actually used and implemented, there's so many different flavors and types of it that it's, uh, it's, it's amazing in its diversity. So to help people get their heads around that, uh, you know, it can be confusing. The problem is you give people a template, they're going to follow it, right? And sometimes it works, sometimes it's a square peg in a round hole, sometimes it's the hammer and the nail syndrome. The problem is if we don't give you a template, you've got nothing, right? And by nothing, I mean this is really what Toyota did used to do in the old days, is, is give you a uh, blank sheet of paper and say, begin. And that's actually how I learned problem solving in Toyota. I had about a two-hour introductory class, was given a blank sheet of A3 paper and said, begin. And of course, it's a, a methodology designed to have you struggle and fail and check in with your boss and get coaching. and. I think I rewrote my first A3 13 times, and then he let me present it to somebody else, and it got you know, critiqued and judged and scored and moved on from there. And that, that's fine. Okay, Toyota did it that way for reasons that worked in Japan for that point in history and uh, that sort of thing. But we, we, we got to go faster. I, I joke that Taiichi Ono really built the Toyota production system between 1950 and 1973, 23 years. Well, guess what? You don't get 23 years. You, you, you've got 23 months. Right? And the clock's ticking. So we, we have to go faster. We have to get better at this and uh, figure out solutions for our world that works for, for you, like the Delphi guys have presented and some other you know, companies are going to present later today. 
And one way of simplifying this, I hate to oversimplify the issue, but I do believe there are at least four main types of problem solving patterns in Toyota, historically and even today. The terms may vary a little bit, but there's a logic and reason to each one. And I call them one, troubleshooting, two, gap from standard, three, target setting, and four, innovation. And a lot of people immediately get edgy right off the bat when I say troubleshooting, because isn't that firefighting? Isn't that bad? Isn't that where we're trying to get away from? And my answer is yes and no. Y yes, we do not want a Band-Aid. You do not want to have bad troubleshooting that over superficially addresses things. But good, trou good troubleshooting is part of TPS and should be part of your lean efforts. And the math is this simple. In a big Toyota vehicle plant, for example, there are 10,000 people. Excuse me, 7,000 people in total. 5,000 in production, 2,000 in various support functions. There are on average around the world in a Toyota plant 10,000 and-on cord pulls a day. Do you honestly think that Toyota's writing an A3 report or holding a Six Sigma project on those 10,000 and on cord pulls per day? You know, they're of course not. They're, 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 they're not. Nobody can. I can't do it. You can't do it. It doesn't matter. It's physically not possible. So a lot of their troubleshooting routines are very rapid and action-based. And I joke that there's a good reason for that. It's like if your house is on fire, what do you really need? I need the fire department to show up and put it out. That's pretty heroic and noble. Okay. I need a good skilled tradesperson, a good customer service rep to step in and solve the immediate problem and take care of the situation. If you showed up at my house with a clipboard and started asking me the five whys, right, while my house is on fire, I would probably smack you upside the head. Okay? And Toyota, frankly, is for that reason a, a, a company that has always had a very strong culture of rapid troubleshooting. In Japanese, we call it Ijo Shochi. It translates closely to abnormality management or troubleshooting. But it's, it's a big part of the system. And you've all seen the pictures, OK? It's been in textbooks. And I'll show you the 1958 image where it originally came from in a couple slides. But it requires that, that employees or, or equipment stop the line at any type of abnormality. So your house is on fire, OK? Or the ceiling falls down on me. Or there's a missing piece of material or information. The employee in Toyota stops the line. The only way that works is if you have a qualified team leader, supervisor type of person who can show up and say, OK, this abnormality, let's go into this mode, this standard operating procedure for dealing with this abnormality, putting out the fire, putting out the urgent problem of the moment. Okay? And I think that gets downplayed. I don't think organizations around the world, my humble opinion, pay enough respect to this skill. Because again, my job in Toyota was help setting up overseas facilities. That's what I did early in my career. The number one problem we struggled with with new facilities was, was developing this role, developing this skill set. Even for us, it would take a couple years before we were comfortable with where places would get. And to further drive home my point, we, we made a video. This is a video of 30 years old, and I won't play the video. Uh, I think they, they shot it in my plant, Comigo. John Shook, my friend, the head of LEI North America, he actually wrote the text in his department, and then we I forget who translated and who edited. We, we changed uh, jobs from time to time. But the, the video actually goes like this. Uh, an automated process is cycling. This was, again, an engine-centric uh, training video. And a mechanical probe number two detects that we had a broken tool, which often happens. You're drilling holes okay, in, in metal. You're going to break a tool from time to time. Imagine a drill, tap, or ream breaking. The abnormality goes up on the end on. And within minutes, usually within seconds, somebody responds. And the, the actual text is very important. The operator immediately takes corrective action and confirms good parts to the following process. So we're, we're checking there's no bad parts in the line, and he's putting a new tool in place. Notice there's nothing in there about the five whys, or an A3 report, or let alone holding a Six Sigma event at this point in time, because he is putting out the fire. We are restarting that line as fast as possible. Uh, I run into companies that say, oh, we're going to stop the line and have a meeting for four hours until we figure this out. You know? Well, good luck. You just created four hours of downtime, and I guarantee you, you blew your metrics for the day and probably the month. So part of Toyota is, OK, we're going to immediately triage this, if you will, fix it best we can in the moment, and get on to running the day while simultaneously saying, uh-oh, is that a one-time event? Or is it going to happen again? And watching very carefully. And of course, if it happens again, we're going to escalate it and behave differently. 
But the predominant thinking pattern, again, Art Smalley's terminology, you will not find this in a Toyota textbook. It's, it's very simple, simple language. I call it, you know, Gemba speak. It's just four C's. What's the concern? The tool broke. What's the cause? Well, we don't immediately know. We're not going to have a, a, a Six Sigma event at this moment in time, let even do the five wide deep dive, because you probably won't know until you run a second part, a third part, a fourth part. And frankly, if the tool doesn't break again, look, it's not going to come up very high in my Pareto chart. If I break five in a row, I got a different problem. But a lot of the times, to get through the day, save the day, protect the customer, make sure our productivity and quality levels where it's at, we're going to address the concern, address the cause best we can, come up with a countermeasure, which in this case was simply replacing the tool and, and checking results. And the check results decides whether this escalates further or not. If the next, next 10 parts, 20, 100 parts are fine, okay, one-time event, maybe it's a defective tool, maybe a hard spot came from casting, I don't know. I'll give it to my team lead, Dave, Dave over there, and say, Dave, find out, figure out, and follow up with me. I'm the team member, but you're, you're my boss, so go do, go do some work for me, all right? <laughs> take this tool and have it inspected, take this machine, take this part, and see if they're bad. And if not, then call maintenance over. I want them to do a run-out check on the spindle and see if it's the bearings are starting to wear out. Okay, boss? All right. See, in Toyota, we make the leaders work for us, not the other way around. <laughs> so simple thinking predominates most of the frontline troubleshooting at Toyota. And this is, I stole the latest and greatest LEI example of this from the book, The Kaizen Express. And you'll notice, look, hourly plan versus actual. And then you'll always notice and every plant, if you actually look at the details, every plant's different. Some write problem cause, some write cause countermeasure, some write problem solution. Okay, it's not 100% as standardized as you would think if you actually go gather the forms and look. All right. But there is some element of the cause thinking in there that promoting, 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 because we do want to understand the cause. If you, if you don't, it's, it's very likely to reoccur. And the most important thing is to start the engagement levers of, of why. Okay, why is that happening? Why is that occurring? Okay, so that, that initial picture I showed you, okay, that's my day depiction of it. That, that's actually from a book, uh, a handwritten cartoon in a Toyota book that goes back about 40 years. And they knew that for their front line and their system of production to work, the flow system, you know, the very minimal buffers and high requirements for, uh, for low, low inventory and very rapid changeover, things like that. It, it relies upon what they back then called the, the almighty supervisor. And I'll give you a, 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 look, a piece of advice. Almighty supervisors are far and few between in the natural world. They, they have to be created. That has been the thrust of, the, of, of training and development. If you look at it from a four-decade point of view, the majority of training time in Toyota over the decades has gone towards that team leader and group leader position because developing these six, six skill sets, safety, job ability, team leadership skills, problem solving skills, technical knowledge, and the spirit of human relations is, is not easy. That is a very challenging job, but I'll argue one of the best things that Toyota does is, is make team leaders and group leaders through their process and system over time. Okay? And I don't want to trivialize or downplay that. That's, that's why I say it's, it's type one problem solving in, in my lingo. It's very, very important. And frankly, it's 80%. It's if, you, if you call every and on, Cord, pull, a problem, a problem. Well, 80 or 90 percent are getting addressed like this, if not more. All right? So this has to be a part of your lean system and structure and strategy for dealing with it if you have that kind of style of problems occurring like, like Toyota does. Again, you, you, your, your environment may be different, meaning a different solution space. But that's not the end. Of course, you know, Toyota started that in the 1950s and continued it through the 60s and on the day. The thing that Toyota became most famous for, and the Japanese in general, was what I call type two problem solving, a gap from standard. And the Japanese did not invent it. We can go through the history books, and I'll, I'll talk more about it in the afternoon. But you can find the inputs of this all the way back to the, uh, the early part of the 20th century. Too many people to mention here. But the Japanese got a five-step program from the Americans after World War II. They immediately turned it into a six-step program and a 12-step QC model, and started running with it in the 1960s. And by the time I got to Toyota, it was seven steps. And today, they're up to eight steps. So OK, whatever. I don't care. My only question is not how many steps you use. How, how good do you do the steps? To me, it's like golf. I, I don't care what brand of golf clubs you play. I don't even care how many golf clubs you have in your bag. 
I'm going to ask you at the end of the day what's on your scorecard. Did you shoot, did you shoot par? Did you shoot the goal you were shooting for? Okay. And type two, the hallmark is this, this funnel notion. It converges to something very specific okay, and, and gets very specific and detailed. The, the hallmark of it of the, is, of course, root cause analysis. But, you know, the, the part, the, you can surface it in many different ways. There is no one way to surface problems in Toyota. Some, some you will go and see at the Gemba. I, I agree, you've got to go see. Other problems are going to find you off the KPI cascade. You, you miss. This is the harshest one in Toyota. You miss your numbers on the KPI cascade. Guess what? You're on the hot seat. You don't have to go again, but see this problem. It finds you. Right? Same thing, customer phone calls. All right? You get an angry call from the customer. All right, that problem finds you. You may have to go to the customer, find this problem, and see it. But you're going to have situations that are what I call red. You, you did not make your goal. You did not make your standard. You are red. Cost per unit safety, quality, in many different ways can trigger it, internally, externally, okay? And then the magic question is, look at that gap, 100, 194, that's six percentage points of, of theoretical gap, what, what, what is it? In this type of type two problem, we don't know, and troubleshooting by definition won't solve it, because we already, we already did troubleshooting all month on this. <laughs> now my K K KPI number is staring me in the face at the end of the month, and I can't, I can't hide that because it's a fishbowl in Toyota. The metrics are posted, daily review, weekly review, monthly review. There's no hiding. I mean, I'm, I'm naked. Every time I miss a number, it's there for the world to see, and we review it. And the question is, is that one problem of 6%, six problems each of 1%, two problems each contributing 3%? You, you don't know until you break it down. You gotta open it up. It's the prover proverbial can of worms, which is why the process requires fairly prescriptive step steps. Okay, it's a methodology that you follow to get progressing from vague understanding to clear problem understanding to defining the problem, establishing a goal, and getting to some type of cause and effect style insight. It's very re reductionist and very convergent. And Toyota started this program in 1962. Okay. Again, it was called the TQC program. There were some SQC elements to it as well. But the first company training, standardized company training around problem solving started in 1962 and was rolled out, again, company-wide, focus on managers, engineers, and supervisors in, in the beginning. Okay. And I, I joke, the secret to type two is always to dig deeper. Okay, this is not creativity. We'll talk about three and four later, which I think is critical and different. The, the point is you got a defect, you got a safety condition, an abnormality that must be addressed. And the, the million dollar question is what's causing it, why? And it's like a crime show on TV. What's, what's, the what's the forensic data say? You've got to dig and look and dig and look and dig and look. And you, you can ask all the fancy, open-ended Socratic methods you want. You better find the cause, okay? It actually requires some technical skill and expertise. I visited a company, won't say who. Fancy problem-solving routine. Ask all the open-ended questions. They couldn't solve this problem involving the grinder on the right with a dimensional defect problem. And I happen to have a Toyota colleague of mine with me who's got a background in grinders, and he, he solved it in one minute, and he didn't ask a single Socratic question, not a single open-ended question. He just looked at it and said, your, your, your coolant flow is too low. I guarantee you, your coolant flow is too low. And they said, no, impossible, can't be, blah, 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 blah. No, look, and they, they traced the, the wire, and there was a kink in the hose at the end, and sure enough, the coolant flow was low. They turned the coolant flow up and did a 30-part capability study afterwards and it magically improved. And they'd been working on this Six Sigma and Lane and all kinds of people for, for months. And the point is not to make fun of them. The, the point is that problem solving often requires technical subject matter expertise. If you can combine both, you, you are almighty. You're back to my almighty supervisor image. If you just have open-ended Socratic questions and method, well, you're a, a one-armed wonder, okay? I want six arms. I want octopus man, octopus woman, six arms, right, who can tackle that problem in many ways. And one of them, don't kid yourself, is technical expertise. I mean, I coach problem solving in our national laboratory system in the United States. There are some problems you cannot solve unless you are a qualified subject matter technical expert. Okay? It is very hard. You cannot method. You cannot always method things to death. And I think this is a big misunderstanding about Toyota. We actually have deep pockets of functional expertise for the process we're doing, whether it's IT, customer service, design, or manufacturing work. So please, as you go forward with your flavor of doing this, not mine, marry good problem-solving steps with good 
technical skills and ability in the, uh, the thing being solved. The generic steps don't change. I don't care whether it's Six Sigma programs or Toyota's latest style or the 1950 version that Toyota started with, handed over by Americans during the, uh, the occupation era after the, war, after the war. You're going to define it. You're going to set a goal. Hopefully it's a smart goal. And you're going to analyze it. And even in Toyota, we have far more than one way to analyze things. The number one, okay, top two mistakes I, I, I find in, in type two problem solving around the world is people assume they have to use only the five Y or the fishbone. And the problem is they don't do either very well. The, the five Y somehow becomes a, a contorted five who, you know, who can I blame about why this occurred, which is a fundamental flaw. Or the five Y becomes this staircase of logic, which is so convoluted and goes around a circle, it's, it's literally makes absolutely no sense. And it takes critical thinking to do logic. Five Y is logic, deductive, and inductive critical thinking. And that is tough to coach into some people. It requires you know, some, some skills. The other thing that people screw up is, is the fishbone. You know, the, the real name for the fishbone diagram is, is the Ishikawa diagram, or, or cause and effect diagram. And we have this strange notion that a fishbone, which is supposed to be cause and effect, is determined by brainstorming which is a creativity technique. Historically, it's a creativity technique. And you can use it to brainstorm potential causes. I get it, I get it. But the majority of my clients, when they do the brainstorming version of the fishbone, they come up with presupposed opinions of, of what the cause is. And I call, them, I call that a wishbone. Good luck. Good luck solving problem solving with a wishbone. You, you can wish and think about it. At the end of the day, for my, my, my friend's grinders example over there, they wished it was 20 things. Uh, not one of them identified imp improper coolant flow to uh, fix it. And, but we, we start with logic. Th be that as it may, you, you'll try 5Y and Fishbone and, and you'll struggle with it. Be prepared to deal with that and coach it and push and, and, and coach the thinking to be more critical, more in depth, and test the, the nature of it. But some problems can only be solved by statistics. And even Toyota does this. There, there are process capability studies done by engineers such as myself previously because the human dimension cannot really solve certain types of problems objectively. We are subjective creatures by nature. Some things must be measured quantitatively, objectively, and only the statistics will tell you if you're on the right track or not. It's the old correlation is not causation problem, but I guarantee if it doesn't correlate, it sure as heck doesn't stand a chance of being a cause. So there are statistical routines we'll use in Toyota, which we call OVAT, one variable at a time, and the, the more complex MVAT, multiple variable time, uh, design of experiment types things. And, and frankly, 100% of us are trained in what I call the logic family. Maybe only 5 or 10% of the company goes through the, the more sophisticated training for the statistical quality control. And then le less than 1% of the population can really, is really certified and capable in those multivariate type of problem solving routines. Because again, frankly, most of the time you don't need it. Okay? Most of the time you don't need it. Um, the other thing I want to talk about while we're on the topic of the five whys is don't, don't get hung up on the number five, all right? It's a misunderstanding. The, the five why example comes from my plant, Comigo. It was a milling machine. It was a true example. And Ono used it to push the, the why, why, why thinking until he got a good answer. The, the key point is did you get to a countermeasure which prevents it from recurring? The, the five is all relative to where you start in the causal analysis tree. I can turn this into a three Y example really quickly if I just start lower with the problem statement. It's five in this case because they started asking why did the machine stop. I can create more Ys in this. The point is it's good, it's fairly good critical thinking deducing the cause and some induction routines of ob observations are involved as well. But the point is why did we stop at five on this one? There's no magic. The laws of physics, physics and math did not make five a magic number. <laughs> There's nothing magical about five. They stopped at five in this case because at this level, for this example, I have a countermeasure which is sticky. It is a strainer put on the inlet port of a tank which blocks the metal cutting chips from coming in. And all people get excited about the five Y. Well, guess what? There's a sixth Y there, guys. Why did the chips get in the cutting tank? All right. Why did the cutting chips form as large as they did and get cast out of the machine in the first place? I, I can go to a sixth Y, seventh Y. I can take this down to nuclear physics, you know, and atomic structure if we need to about why, why tools cut metal. The point is it's ridiculous to go that far. In this case, this 
five Y is the first place where I can cut and stop it and the, the countermeasure will stick. If my countermeasure was training or standardized work, it's not gonna stick. Even if it's error proofing, okay, it sticks but doesn't really catch the problem. This is the first five Y where Ono said it prevents the problem from recurring. That's what I want. The holy grail of this is I want a countermeasure that prevents it from recurring. Is it the root cause? I'll argue no. I'll argue there's a sixth Y and seventh Y lurking in this, if not more. But the point is, I got to a countermeasure which is going to stick and is not going to irritate the employee. I'm not increasing inspection. I'm not increasing standardized work. I'm not asking for more training, which is burdensome, to, you know, burdensome and a waste of resources. I'm doing simple, effective things that will problem solve this at the root, or at the source where it's occurring, and it's very likely to stick. Employees would be delighted by this solution. Doesn't doesn't burden them in any way. Maintenance might complain about the strainer and having to do PM, you know, once a month or something like that. But there's there's a way out of that problem, which I'll talk about this afternoon. Key point on type two is, is we like to talk about it and we like to show fancy slides. I, I've met very few companies around the world that are that are naturally good at it. Okay, even Toyota struggles with this. It is just assumed that you will need to learn problem solving when you join the company, and it's a journey. And the, the analogy I think Dan made about thinking fast and thinking slow is very appropriate because the people who study, the Nobel Prize winner who studies behavioral psychology points out that we as humans are hardwired to do what he calls system one, which is very similar to what I'm calling type one troubleshooting or problem solving. You, we will naturally do that to survive, right? A lion, if a lion came over there, I'd be first out the door, okay? I'd, I'll race you, right? I'll survive. Type one ref reflexes will kick in. Type two thinking, again, is why did this problem really occur? How do we prevent it? It's thinking slower. Y you must create that. That will not occur naturally in your organization. You as a manager, you as a leader have to create the structures for that to occur. Okay. Honestly, if you can do type one and type two well, you're probably going to lead your, lead your company or lead your, potentially even lead your industry. The amazing thing to me about Toyota and its journey is they, they did that in the 50s and 60s. And by most estimates, they'd caught up with Western levels of quality and productivity by the early 70s, and they decided to go farther. This is really when the notion of, of, of target state, future state setting, Kaizen, came into play. And they said, look, we're good, but guess what? We're going to be better. Just because you solve the problem doesn't mean it's done. And, and this is where managers really get stressed in Toyota. It was easier for me the first half of my career in Toyota when I argue I was doing troubleshooting and problem solving. You get to that next level, back to that dreaded white piece of paper. Art, what do you want this area, this process to look like next year? Because it's got to be 10% better. It's baked into the annual plan. It's baked into the goals and objectives, Hoshin Connery. What are you going to do? I don't know. Well, good news is you got a year to figure it out, but um, it, it's amazing, right? We think 100% on-time delivery, we're done, we're there. Well, I want 100% on-time delivery with half the lead time. Well, I got zero defects to the customer. We never do, but let's say it's really, really low defects to the customer. Yeah, I, I want that with, with half the scrap rate this year and half the time spent in inspection, in inspection and containing things because some of that zero defects to the customer, guess what, came through inspection work or something like that. So Toyota's remarkable to me in the sense that they, 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 they really raised the bar in the 70s saying we can be better. And it, it doesn't matter. Safety, quality, cost, delivery, productivity, morale. Maybe the easiest way of saying this is type two. Type one and two problems have data for you to analyze. They're, it's reactive. The data exists. Go and see it. Go and get it. Your flavor of figuring that out. Type three problems are far more leadership oriented. You, you must set the vision for your area, what you want it to be three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now. It could be the spare parts process. It could be the customer service process. It could be the production line. But using existing materials, largely, small, small capital perhaps, how are you going to make a productivity improvement in your area? That is not root cause analysis. And it gets to the problem I see in most Western companies is that when we approach type three, and you, you can put it in steps, but guess what? Steps don't matter so much for type three. You can hold a Kaizen event 
an activity, value stream map, whatever you want, and I, I dare you to find anybody making the steps, even in Toyota, the exact same way. The steps tend to get in the way because type three problems are fundamentally less about critical thinking and more about creative thinking. Critical thinking convergent is reductionist, right? Creative thinking diverges and is more of a synthesis type of thing. Requires experimentation, willingness to learn. And this is where, again, phrases like true north, I think, in spirit, do, do kind of justice to the notion. I, I'm going that direction. I, I just don't know how I'm going to get there. We'll, we'll and there's no root cause, no one root cause. I, I like type two problem solving. Like eventually, I can figure it out, right? One cause, one effect, if I'm lucky, or two or three causes, one effect. Make a better target state. I may have to do 15, 20, or 30 things. Depends. I don't know. Math and logic isn't going to help me as much here. So some of us aren't as wired to, to do as well on this type of stuff. A, a famous example where problem solving can begin, and these things have shades of gray. Problem solving can begin, type three, target state Kaizen. M most people know the famous story in Toyota of setup reduction. Now after World War II, they were just like Western Europeans and Americans, took four hours to change over a stamping die, a big stamping die in a machine. And what Toyota did through problem solving was, was, again, to get that availability, OEE number, up higher, higher, was problem solved, problem solved, problem solved. And the textbooks of, of Toyota, the internal archives, the things that record the, the Toyota history show that the average change over time in Toyota was 1962. 15 minutes in 1962. Th that was already world class at that point in time. We didn't know it because nobody was studying Toyota in those days. But the, the, the Europeans and Americans and the rest of the world was still stuck around, up around two and three hours. Toyota had already raised the bar to 15 minutes. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had gotten it down to 15 minutes, I'd probably right, pat myself on the back and say, phew, we're in the lead now, let's stop. Uh, Taiichi Ono and the managers of that time period wired differently. This is where the target state came from. From 1962 to 1973, 11 years, they took it from 15 minutes to a, a average die change over time of three minutes. Do the math, it's, it's one minute per year. <laughs> they, they were challenging the organization even at that point in time. You're, you're world class, I want one minute faster next year. One minute faster next year. And then beyond 1973, the number fundamentally hasn't, hasn't gotten that much faster because there are, there are diminishing returns. There are limits and diminishing returns at some point, obviously. But the, the amazing thing to me is they didn't stop. There's no problem. Technically, there is no gap from standard. There's no problem. There's no root cause. <laughs> Figure out at 15 minutes. That is just endless kind of courage and creativity and willingness to experiment. And I, I joke that you just have to take the spirit of this. And so, some people say that doesn't apply to my world. And I was in the National Laboratories not too long ago, and they were sharing an improvement example with me. And they were quite adamant, well, we, we don't really do lean because none of those tools work for us because we're the IT department. All right? But I ask them, but I bet you guys believe in problem solving and improvement, don't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Show me your latest and greatest improvement example that you're proud of. And they, they, tar they talked about, I'm not an IT guy, so bear with me. They talked about how they used to have all these hundreds of dedicated servers. And this is a big place, 10,000 people, one of our biggest national laboratories, okay? And we all stayed the dedicated servers. Some were Unix, some were Linux, some were Windows, and different flavors of Windows. And each, each one within those could then only run certain problems. So we had 100 servers, and all of them only worked 10% of the time. But they have to be energy, you know, energy, they suck energy 100% of the time. So the electric bill is phenomenally high, maintenance is high, spare parts cost is high, it's hard to repair all these. And then this uh, development happened in the software world where you can run a virtual server. And on that virtual server, you can have boxes within a box conceptually, software somehow. And now I can run all three operating systems on one server and, and solve many customers on one server. And I listened to him politely and said, I know this problem. It's the same thing as SMED. You've just done a software version of, of setup and die rejection. You've gone from dedicated machines with low utilization and no flexibility to a highly flexible process with high flexibility and less energy cost, less maintenance cost. And I think they were insulted. They got the point, but somehow I think they were kind of insulted by that because they were quite proud of the fact they were doing improvement, but they weren't lean. 
And that, that's a problem, because I actually ask that question a lot of organizations. How, how many in here are excited to do? If I ask your, your organizations, how many are going to say, yeah, we're, we're all fired up and ready to do lean? Not, not too many hands go up. But if you ask anywhere around the world, hey, hey, you ready to problem solve and do some improvement? Oh, yeah, I mean, who's not, who's not game for that? So the fact, that, the fact that lean doesn't equate with problem solving and improvement to a lot of people, frankly, that's, that's, that's a problem we've got in the terminology and perception of, of the movement. Be that as it may, you know, type three routines are great because they, they enable us to think differently about the work we're doing, come up with better ways, more fun, better, interesting ways. And it's a, it's a great way to engage people, the hearts and minds. Okay, look, the, the area is the way it is now, but only if we allow it to be. You want a better mousetrap? Let's, let's think about making a better mousetrap, all right? There is a type four. And I'm not going to go into detail on this, and I don't think Toyota's got the, uh, the recipe card figured out for this, but the unique thing is they do innovation, type four, bigger innovation, new products, new markets, new geography very, very well. Um, and they do it small, medium, and large ways, though. The, the, the traditional thing about innovation, and I, when I worked at McKinsey and Company, this was very true. It's, it's a special group, elite group behind closed doors doing breakthrough work, and that's fine. Now, there's, big, there's a time and a place for big innovation. But I think the remarkable thing about Toyota was the, the belief about this was innovation can occur at the front line, in the middle of the organization, and the front line. All, all of us can be innovators for what we do. We can be very creative. The, the next thing, what's the next good thing in our area that we have to work on? So the, the smallest example of that has been in existence for you know, almost 60 years now at Toyota, the suggestion system. When I, when I retired from Toyota, I was retired, I left the company. The, uh, company was uh, in their fourth year of the suggestion system and they were, uh, they, they actually had quantified over 40 years, 20, 20 million implemented solutions. So you can, do, you can do the math, that's half a million improvement ideas per year on average. And today that number is north of a million. Worldwide the number is north of a million small creative ideas. In Japanese it's actually called the creative idea suggestion system. It's, it's close to the English word for uh, innovation. Um, the big, big picture innovation, look, it's really not my flavor or specialty. I just, I just caution people, think about this carefully. Don't fall into the trap of that innovation is only elitist groups working on the product. It, 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 there's a time and a place for that. But I, I really like the framework that this, this group get put together called the 10 Types of Innovation and breaking into three segments, configuration, offering, experience, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 areas. And you can compete in many different ways. Toyota's famous for, on the configuration side, maybe the structure and the processes, superior methods to do your work. I think that's where Dan kind of started with the, the Porter work and how Toyota approaches that differently. But I'm also going to argue that very successful companies do it differently. If, if you think of Apple, for example, they're probably more famous for the, the bottom part of this innovation framework, the service, the channel, the brand, and the customer engagement. I mean, Apple beats the pants off of uh, my, my cell phone company, uh, Samsung, for a good reason. And I don't have the Note 7. I got the Note 4, so it's not going to burn, hopefully. But Apple is beating the pants. I, I guarantee you the technology with this phone and Apple is not that great, okay? However, Apple beats the pants off people on the service channel, brand, and customer engagement in a lot of markets. And when Toyota created the Lexus brand, that was the number one problem they had to face. It wasn't the product quality. We, we, they were pretty confident they could make a high quality product vehicle. There was less confidence in the company. They could establish a service channel, a brand and customer engagement that would work around the world. And they, they successfully did that in Japan, North America, lesser extent in Europe and, and other countries. But um, the, the key to innovation is not always just the product box. So I ask you to think out of the box sometimes on, on process and things like that. So four types of problems. Again, I, I'm going to argue to my death that one size does not fit all. Even within type two, I can create subtypes if I want. And I think you, you have to think about your situation, what you're facing, to the extent it's Toyota-like or not Toyota-like, and come up with your answers for this. Uh, my analogy and the hint for doing this, by the way, came up in research. The, the Japanese professor Ishikawa, Kaoru Ishikawa, when he wrote the, the type two problem-solving handbook for Japan, he, he said seven QC tools were enough. Most lean companies I visit today, yeah, upwards of 100. Okay, Delphi was moderate today, 30, so I, I cut him a little slack. But this guy, this professor said, seven are enough. 
He said, I can solve 95% of the problems in the world with, with six steps and seven tools. It's an internet statistic. It's not real. There's no factual proof behind this. 30 might be the right answer, by the way. I, I don't know. But my point is, the reason why he came up with seven, it's actually got a, a literature, a cultural literal reference called uh, Benke. And his story was, Benke won all his battles. He's like a 12th century uh, action hero in Japan, like, like William Tell or Robin Hood or something like that. Okay? And he won all his battles, no, undefeated. All school kids know Benke. And the thing why, why Japanese like Benke is he's, he's the clever one. He's not the strongest, fastest, biggest guy. He, he's the cleverest. And Ishikawa picked seven because it was the, the analogy that in problem solving, you, the, the most clever wins. So he, wants you to, he wanted Japanese in the 1960s to be clever like Benke and figure out the right tools for the right situation. Don't, don't buy and don't, don't just get too hung up on the framework and one way of doing things. Uh, in, in the end, you solve the problem. If you don't, I can argue it's, it's waste and frustration. So summary, uh, Benke is my hero, okay? Analogy, think about that in problem solving. Be like Benke, all right? Don't, don't be the Japanese word baka, because the opposite of benke is baka, and baka means fool, right? And uh, baka only knows one way usually. I, I think an expert knows many ways. I respect people who know one way and do it very well. I respect more people who knows seven ways of doing it and tell me the pros and cons and strengths and weaknesses of each one, right? There's a different reason for the types. If you don't like four, okay, maybe your world's three. Uh, I'm not going to dicker with you there, but there's a, a purpose to the time and cadence and focal point for each one I've outlined today. Um, reflection is absolutely important of all this, but look, don't, don't go too gung-ho on the Hansei. People invite me to companies and see their Hansei meeting, and they haven't solved anything, so I, I, I joke. You don't, you don't earn the right to Hansei until you serve the problem, problem gang. My, my Hansei right now is you, you didn't solve the problem, so let's get back to root cause analysis. It was a type two, for example. Uh, learning by doing cannot be skipped. I'm going to joke that lean is like a martial art. Guess what? You don't get good by doing that, reading the book. Uh, you step into the dojo, you get thrown, you learn the techniques, you get better by, better, better by doing. And um, all of this requires a high degree of perspiration and willingness to learn, fail, and do, and get better at it. Um, like I said, ono, ono took 23 years. You, you get 23 months, so good, good luck. <laughs> With that, I'll stop. So I think we're, um, Thanks, Hop.